Our guest today is a copywriter, full stack marketer, and email deliverability expert. Over the past five years, he's managed lists from 1,000 to 200,000 active subscribers in a variety of markets, including SaaS, e-commerce, online education, coaching, and more. Now, he partners with entrepreneurs and business owners to fix deep-seated deliverability issues, boost email performance, and grow revenue. He's the author of the Deliverability Now newsletter, where he sends out weekly tips and strategies designed to help uh, to help you win big with email. He lives in Portland, Oregon, with his wife, Lisa and Kat Clementine. Welcome to the show, Matt Brown. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Jen. Really, uh, really grateful to be here. Uh, Email. Okay, Uh, so, you know, let's just start with the fact that like how amazing it is that email even still works like with all the tools we have at our fingertips from ai to chatbots automation you know all the things live streaming um just a million different tools platforms everything at our fingertips somehow email still works why why does email still work do you think yeah that's a great point a great question i think email at least for all of the clients that i work with it's still their most effective and profitable sort of middle of funnel and bottom of funnel um, marketing channel especially if you're selling something that is a little bit more abstract like coaching or education something that's not like an e-commerce product that can trigger a kind of impulse buy, you know, if you're on TikTok and you see, oh, a cool supplement that's going to help my skin or going to help my brain or something like that, you click through, all right, it's 30 bucks. Yeah, let's just go ahead and buy that. But if you're trying to sell somebody $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 worth of Mm -hmm. products, um, email is so fantastic because you can have a conversation with that person over a long period of time and build trust with, you know, your subscribers at scale. And I think it's just hard to do that on any other marketing platform just because of the cost, but also because attention is so divided when we're on social media, you know, we're watching TV, we're scrolling Instagram or Mm -hmm. whatever. So people still use email and it definitely still works. And I anticipate it working for a long time, but who knows, maybe Gen Alpha will finally kill email. We'll see. (laughs) Well, you know, everything you said is true for my business. Um, I'm in my 11th year in business and, you know, we launch a product. We, you know, we, we use all the other channels, but we make the sales and email. And, um, but the, the ticket is, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is that in order for email to work in your marketing and to make sales for you, people have to see your email. Your email has to get through and it's a real problem. And, um, And so I guess, why don't we start by talking about the difference between email deliverability and email placement? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that's something that I like to talk with all of my clients about and all the people on my newsletter is that when I work with people, I find that people can either have a true deliverability problem or they could have a placement problem. So an email deliverability problem is when your emails are not being delivered. So like that is the purest form of a deliverability problem. You go into active campaign or convert kit or entreport or HubSpot, you hit send and nobody gets them. And, you know, there's a variety of reasons that that can happen, you know, to have your emails not being delivered. It can have to do with your technical setup. It could have to do with a block list that's blocking your emails. It could have to do with your reputation with certain inboxes, you know, with Google or Outlook or AOL or Yahoo, where they're saying, we don't trust you as a sender, so we're not even going to deliver your emails. That's the worst type of problem to have. And it's very rare to encounter that, at least with the types of clients that I'm working with, because Mm -hmm. they're practicing opt-in email marketing. They're getting permission to send emails that's typically going to be the problem a spammer encounters because they're just emailing email addresses. They scrape from the internet, you know, in mass and they're promoting garbage offers. And so it's, it's rare to encounter that. And when I do, it's almost always connected to a technical problem, meaning their email authentication uh, records are not set up correctly. Mm -hmm. 
so what most people I'm working with, they have placement problems. So that means when they send out an email, a percentage of them go to the spam folder, a percentage of them go to the promotions tab, a percentage of them go to the primary tab. And that's what leads to really um, inferior email performance results is when you know, you, you can't get your messages truly in front of your subscribers, the, you know, the people you paid to acquire. Um, so, I mean, you touched on the factors that affect email de de deliverability and like over the years, I've just heard so many things like don't put pictures in your, your email, put pictures in your email. Uh, don't put links in your email, put links in your email, um, make your email look really pretty, like a really pretty newsletter, make your email look like it just came from your brother. Um, you know, I mean, totally. what, what are, what, what is the, what is the thinking now? Yeah. So th that sort of thinking is really at a lower level of strategy when it comes to email deliverability. So anyone that's like obsessing over content doesn't truly understand the factors that impact deliverability and placement, because in my experience, I see this every single day with my clients, your content is secondary when it comes to delivering your emails. It's still very important, but the thing that is more important than your content is your reputation. So I'll kind of break these up and they're connected because your content creates your reputation, but your sender reputation as someone who sends emails to inboxes trumps whatever you put in your email. And I'll, I have a little anecdote and I'll prove it to you okay, uh, here in a minute. Awesome. So your sender reputation, it's connected to your domain. So the domain name that you use to send emails, you know, I send emails from deliverabilitynow.com. And there's, I have a certain reputation that I've established with the inboxes as someone who sends email from that domain. Your sender reputation is also connected to your IP reputation. So for most people, their IP addresses, the IPs that are actually delivering their emails, these are coming from your email platform. So active campaign, convert kit, HubSpot, drip, they're putting you on a shared IP pool with hundreds or thousands of other people. And that's what's sending your emails. So you need to check to see, do you have, are you on high reputation IPs or are you on low reputation IPs? And if you don't, yeah, yeah. If you don't know, then. <laughs> For those of you who are just listening, I raised, I raised my hand. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> because, um, okay, wait, like, so this, I've heard this and this is very concerning to me because obviously if you're on ClickFunnels, if you're on ConvertKit, if you're on Entreport, if you're on any of these places, you're sharing that space with a gazillion other marketers. You're not sharing it with a bunch of librarians, right? Exactly. And so, well, maybe you are. I mean, maybe you are. It's a librarian with a course, though. It's, totally, <laughs> it's a librarian totally. with an online course <laughs> that they're selling. No, no, but seriously, so how could we not have anything but a bad reputation when people are you know, like it's like the name of the game is, I mean, we, well, and when we're in a launch, we send a massive amount of emails, even though we, it's permission marketing. And every time I go into a big launch, it never fails that there are people that say too many emails and they get mad. And then they, and then they, I mean, we do, we try to prevent all that with a warning in advance, a thing mm -hmm. at the very top, not opt hitting out. at the bottom to let them opt out of the launch. We do all of that never fails though. And I just, you know, I've, I've built up a, a suit of armor. So I don't get my feelings hurt anymore. But if I'm doing that and all 20, 50,000 other people on, um, on click, uh, convert kit are doing the same thing. How can mm -hmm. we not have a bad reputation? Okay. So that's a great question. And I also say the people who are responding to your emails in anger, saying you're sending out too many emails, they're doing you a favor because they're actually helping your sender reputation because they're replying to your email. So unless they're marking them oh. as spam, <laughs> right then there's no, there's no issues there. Angry responses are as good as happy responses. So, um, but your question about like, how could you not have a bad reputation? This is connected to how email platforms stay in business. So ConvertKit, ActiveCampaign, Entreport, HubSpot, all of these platforms, they are really in the business of maintaining the reputation of their IPs and making sure that everybody who's sending emails from their platform is 
above board, following best practices, getting good results. But here's what, you know, doesn't get talked about a lot. It's kind of like a little secret in the email world is that the IPs that you get assigned to are based on your collective email performance. So if you're a really high, you know, if you, you get a lot of engagement on your emails, Active Campaign is going to put you on their best IPs because they know, okay, you're a great player. Oh. You're keeping these IPs nice and warm and good standing with the inboxes. We want to put you with all the other people that are like this because you're our A player. So these are our pristine IP addresses. But if you start getting low results, if you're getting low opens, a lot of spam complaints, bounces, they're going to put you on like a more of a middle tier IP where the, the, an IP is only one factor. So I don't want to get too fixated on this. Your domain okay, okay. is definitely more important than your IP. But then you're on a platform with people who you know, maybe not, they're not doing anything intentionally wrong, but they're not doing a good job with their list hijink. They're sending out emails with low engagement. And then those IP addresses that are actually sending your emails are in lower standing with the inboxes. It's not always enough to seriously negatively impact your emails, but it can be. Um, and then if like things are really bad, then you're going to basically be quarantined in like a really bad set, you know? So it's kind of like, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer with IPs. And you want to be able to keep an eye on this um, to just know what reputation do the IPs that are sending your emails have, you know? So, so you have to well, be able to check that. How do you know, how do you know what, what's going on? Like, for example, um, just yesterday, I had a strategy call with my um, VIPers and one of uh, the VIPers asked me to, um, audit her web page. So I went to her web page and I signed up for her um her lead magnet and it didn't come. And I went to look in spam and there was in spam. Oof. And I was like, uh oh. And her provider was I had to look it up. Um it was from Funnel Gorgeous. You know, do you know Funnel Gorgeous? It also called FG. I think um, Funnel Gorgeous white labels go high level. Oh do they? I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty. Sh I, I'm sorry, Funnel Gorgeous people, if I'm wrong. But <laughs> a lot of these, a lot of these new platforms, are just white labeling some other platform. So like, I, I, I think I've encountered this situation before where Funnel Gorgeous they have like courses and they teach people how to do a lot of this stuff, but they also give you a tool. I think that email tool is just white labeled Go High Level, which is Go High Level's business model. Well, what would my client go back to them and be like, you need to help me with this? Or like, what, what is this? What, do, what do we do if it, well, first of all, how do we find out if we're going in people's spam? And number two, what do we do about it? If we find that out? Yeah. So for starters, is that too, too big of a question. No, no, no. That, that's a great question. Okay. Let's work on the assumption that they are actually using go high level to send their emails. I've said it a, a couple of times. It's not my favorite platform. I don't have anything against it. It's just like, it's a newer tool and I'm just more wary of, you know, unproven tools. But I think the way Go High Level works is that they require you to connect your own like SendGrid or Mailgun account to actually send your emails. So I, it depends on how they have this set up. Is that but... like Cloudflare, those two things that you mentioned? No, Cloudflare is a CDN. It's a content delivery network. So that's going to be like a way to like serve up a cached version of your website and basically make your website faster. But Cloudflare like will take over your DNS records. So that's where like all of your, you know, C name records and text records will be, including your email authentication records. SendGrid and Mailgun, these are like enterprise level transactional bulk email tools. And in fact, a lot of the email platforms out there are just built on top of SendGrid or Mailgun. You know, Kajabi uses Mailgun to deliver its emails. Oh. ConvertKit uses SendGrid to deliver its emails. Um, ActiveCampaign, I think they use an Amazon service to deliver their emails, but like your client who has to go high level, SendGrid is probably sending their emails, but and my, my guess is that the reason they're going to spam is not connected to their IP. It's probably connected to their domain or their sender reputation or their history of spam complaints. Um, so the way you fix that is to one, 
identify what the true cause of the issue is. And then once you know what the cause is, then you can rectify it basically. Okay. Sorry. Let's back up. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm not, let's say I'm sending, I, I do an email campaign yeah. um, and I can see because the software lets us see, um, well, we could definitely see the click through rate, but as I understand it, we're not supposed to really pay attention to the open rate. Um, well, it's... yeah, no, like I think open rates, like the people out there who are telling you don't pay attention to open rates. First of all, the majority of them are email platforms because they don't have the ability or they haven't built the ability to differentiate between machine opens and true human opens. You know, some platforms, active campaign, Clavio, some, some of these other tools, they have buttons you can click to filter out Apple privacy opens. So they're giving you a much truer sense of what your actual open rate is, but like, Kajabi and ConvertKit, they just haven't built these tools and they don't necessarily need to because a anyways, I don't want to get, I don't want to go on a whole no, tirade I about open rates. I don't want to get rates. super technical either because <laughs> yeah, yeah. everybody's going to, is going to be like, what? Um, but I, you do want to pay attention to open stuff because open rates are like your heartbeat. And like, if you're consistently getting a 15% open rate or a 20% open rate, you have problems. And if you dip below 10%, I you thought know, 20% was good. No, 20%, 20% is not good, especially if you don't have the ability to filter out Apple privacy opens. Mm. So like, let's say that you're getting a reported 20% open rate in ConvertKit, at least 5% of those opens, if not 10 to 15% are coming from your phone or is coming from a browser that triggers the open pixel. So like a, tw a 20 percent reported open without the ability to filter out machine opens, that's much closer to a 10 to 15 percent true human open rate, which means that 85 to 90 percent of the people you're emailing aren't opening your email. And when you do that long enough over time, that's how you create deep seated deliverability problems like we talked about in the intro. OK, so we we look, we look, we look and we see, oh, I'm getting 20% open rates. That's not good. Uh, although I thought that was industry standard. Not good. I thought 20 to 30 was like industry standard. 30, 30, you're kind of out of the danger zone, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as close as you can be to 50% is amazing. And even yeah. to cold traffic, like I get 50 with my, you know, your customers, my, my customers and the, you know, a much smaller you know, percentage of my whole email list, but, um, okay. Anyway, don't want to get too off. Topic. But if I, so let's say we're looking at our, um, our open rates and we're like, oh man, Matt said 20% is bad. So all these are like 20 and they're 15 and they're 22. Um, and I don't, I don't want to just like fixate on like 20% is bad. Like 20% to me is a sign that something needs to be looked into, you know, 20% is an indication well, to was, me. That's yeah. where I was going with this, whatever the number I got, to, yeah. I got to, you know, you know, whatever my business, let's say I'm looking, I've just got to feel these, they're not getting, I'm not getting responses. I'm not getting clicks. I'm not, yeah. things aren't going well. So my question is what, what is step number one? Like, do, yeah, there's no one to contact or so, what are you saying to contact that? So yeah, like if, if you're using a white label, go high level, like I have very low confidence that whoever's on the other end of that support chat you open up is <laughs> going to be able to help you accurately navigate the complexity of figuring out what's wrong. If it's due to a technical error, they may be able to help you. Like they may be able to say, oh, you haven't added a DKIM record for your email tool and you have a quarantine policy in your DMARC record. That's why this amount of emails are going to spam, you know, or, or something like that. So that would be a pretty easy fix. But like, if you're like, I'm getting a 15% open rate, no one's replying, I'm not making any sales, like, and you open up a support ticket, whether it's with Go High Level or Active Campaign or ConvertKit, like, you're encountering someone who's like a tier one support, you know? So and... what do we do? We just make sure we fix the stuff we have control over the content, the, 
the, you know, list cleaning and that sort of thing, like take control in that way and being more consistent with our, with, with sending out emails or, or what? Yeah. So like, if you're brand new to this and like, this is the first time you're hearing of any of this and you're like, I think I might have a problem. What do I do? Like, here's what I recommend. One, you need to set up a tool called Google Postmaster Tools. It's free. I think it's free for everyone. I could be wrong, but if you have Google Workspace, like for your business email, you're already paying for it. It's included in your subscription. And basically what Google Postmaster Tools is, is it's it's essentially like an email deliverability suite within Google Workspace where you authenticate your domain that you use to send emails from, you prove to Google that you own that domain and that it'll start generating reports about how it views you as an email sender. So it'll tell you what your domain reputation is. That's how you can find out what your IP reputation is from your email platform. It'll tell you what your spam complaints are. And that's this is the really big one because now we're living in like a post February 1st world. That's when Google and Yahoo introduced like their new sender guidelines for the next era of email. Um, and the, the biggest one, the one that is the most important other than all the technical stuff is to keep your spam complaint percentage below 0.1%. So for every 10,000 emails you send, you don't want to get more than 10 spam complaints. And Google does not report spam complaints back to your email platform. So if you go into Entreport or ActiveCampaign or Drip and you look at your campaign report and it says, you sent out 30,000 emails and you got three spam complaints, you're thinking, oh, great, I'm, I'm golden. But none of those spam complaints came from Gmail users. And if your clients and the listeners are anything like my clients, 70 to 80% of their list use Gmail. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so the only place to find your Gmail spam complaint percentage is in Postmaster Tools. So you could log into Postmaster Tools and see like, oh my goodness, we have a 1% spam complaint percentage, you know, for the last 10 campaigns we've sent, that's what's gonna lower your domain reputation and put you in trouble and put you in the spam folder. So that's like step one, it's like, you want to figure out how does Google view you as an email sender if you mail a lot of Gmail users. Like if you're B2B and you're primarily emailing Outlook, it's like a somewhat different process. Um, but I really work with people who have consumer lists mm -hmm. uh, that use Gmail and Google Workspace with like a small percentage of Yahoo, AOL, and Outlook subscribers as well. Okay, great. Um, and then, okay, so we do that and we check and let's say we're all good. Um, then what, what should we focus on next? Like, like how important is the content itself? Yeah, con content is really important. So I know it's, it's secondary to reputation, but an intermediary step too, like before you start, like you look at your domain, you look at all the Google Postmaster stuff before we start looking at content. Okay. I recommend that you run a few placement tests with a seed testing tool. So there's a variety of them out there. And I will say these tools are not 100% accurate, but they're more like a litmus test. Um, and the way that they work is that you sign up for one of these tools and they give you a list of, the, it's a seed list. So they'll give you a list of like 100 email addresses or 30 email addresses from inboxes around the world. You'll have Gmail, Google Workspace, AOL, you know, Zoho, Mail.com, Yandex, like all the major inboxes are represented. And then you go into your email platform, you load all those contacts in there, and then you just send them a few of your campaigns, your actual campaigns. And then there's like a little text line that they'll give you and you insert that into the email. Mm -hmm. And then it'll tell you, you know, what percentage of your emails go to the inbox, what go to promo tab, the newsletters tab, updates tab, the Ooh. spam folder. And that's, so this will give you like a really good, like kind of, you know, bearing of, am I in trouble? Am I not in trouble? Uh, are things good? Are things bad? Um, some tools are a little bit on the negative side, meaning the results that you're going to get are going to be kind of false negatives. And other tools are going to be a little bit on the false positive side. So it's really important to kind of like have a couple data points and triangulate them with your own data to get a sense of where things are at. Okay. Lay it on me. What are these tools? Yeah, so there's Glock apps, uh, or it could be G Lock apps. I, I don't know, but it's like G L O C K A P P S 
zerobounce.com. Okay. There's a tool called Zero Bounce that has placement testing. There's a tool called Emailable that has placement testing. There's another tool called Lit Litmus that has placement testing. And I believe Email on Acid has placement testing. I only used that tool once for like an e-commerce project a long time ago. So it's hard to keep up with all these tools, but Glock apps, Zero Bounce and Emailable, if you, if you run a test in all three of those platforms, you should have a pretty good sense of where you stand with the different inboxes. Awesome. And we went through that list kind of fast. Um, so we will absolutely put that in all those links in the show notes. Um, okay. So w I would love to hear some, well, keep going through the next steps and then <laughs> like wanna... for, con for content. Yeah. W well, okay. all, whatever, what all, whatever the steps are for us to get, get us up and running where we need to be. So kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, I said, oh, I'm going to have an anecdote or I'm going to prove to you that, you know, content is secondary to reputation. So when I work on deliverability optimization projects for client clients, I know the project is done when I can send this one specific email that I have saved on my computer where I have compiled, I went to every email platform and I compiled all of their lists of spam words. So do not use these words in your email. Uh, you know, th th there's not really a lot of validity to those blog posts. And I don't really believe that there are any true spam words. I think it's more like there are true spam senders. So you don't want to ever be considered a spam sender from the inboxes because that's how your emails will go to spam. But I've got this document that has like win free prize, like win of Tesla, become a Bitcoin millionaire overnight, like all the stuff you're not supposed to say. And when I, I know that kind of the project is done for my clients when I can send that email to a seed list, not to real people. I don't want to actually build a reputation of someone who sends this email, but when I can send it to a seed list and it inboxes, I know their reputation is so high that Google and the other inboxes trust them enough as a sender that they're willing to deliver that content, you know? So obsessing over subject lines and preview text and images and body copy and the free is in the link and, you know, workshop webinar, like that is just like an uphill battle. If your reputation isn't high enough, if your reputation is high enough, none of that stuff really matters. There are some things that like, there are best practices that I follow for all emails, but like, don't obsess over content when you just get started, obsess over building your sender reputation. But then with the content, um, what are some of the, a few of the best practices that you always follow. So if you're going to include images, you want to make sure that the image files are as small as possible. Um, you have to think about, you know, Google and Gmail, it's a free product. They want to provide the best experience to their users to keep them on Gmail and to get more people using Gmail so that mm -hmm. they can sell advertising space and get data. <laughs> um, and so if you have an email and there's an image file at the top, and that's the first thing in the email that's going to load and it's four megabytes, like that's going to take a little bit of time. You know, we're talking about milliseconds here. It's going to take more time than a smaller image file to load. And that's like a, that's a, a less optimal, suboptimal experience compared to a fast loading email. And so a mistake I see a lot of, you know, businesses, specifically e-commerce businesses make is that their entire email is one big image. You know, mm. so it's like this huge vertical image. That's like 16 megabytes. They've converted all of the copy into an image file and it looks beautiful, but that's how you really get sent to the promotions folder. That's one of the ways you get sent to the promotions folder because it's going to take a bit of time to load that email and Google just sees, okay, there's one image file in this email and there's you know, 16 words of copy. That's just the unsubscribe footer. It doesn't have an ability to analyze the text that's in the image. So it's automatically more suspicious than an email that has one image, you know, with maybe some header text and then 500 words of copy about a free event or a workshop or a sale that's going on. It can analyze, you know, it can semantically analyze that content to know, what are they talking about? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it promotional? Is it non-promotional? That sort of thing. Do you, um, do you, I mean, it, it is factual 
is it not that getting a reply on your email boosts deliverability if people are replying to your emails, right? Getting a reply to your email helps build your sender reputation. So email is a communication channel and Google wants to see two way communication happening. Like they don't want to just see you emailing a hundred thousand people, you know, every Monday and Thursday and getting no replies. Like they want you, they want people replying to you and then they want you using the email address you use for marketing emails to actually have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. So yeah, um, replies are a positive signal um, for building your sender reputation. Do you do, do you use any tricks or tips or whatever, or strategies I, I should say, um, to get people to reply to your emails, especially like maybe that first one when they, when they sign up for your email list? Yeah, for me, I know that a lot of people have questions about deliverability. And so my call to action in my welcome email is to reply with your questions and I will personally respond to them. And that's what I do. So I get a lot of replies to that. And then, you know, there's just fun things that you can do too. Like if your main call to action is to book a call, have the person reply to start that conversation instead of clicking a call booking link. Oh my um, gosh, that makes so much sense. Yeah, ex exactly. And I feel like it's also like, I don't know, I think it's different personality types, but like, I would rather start the conversation with that person before just like clicking a Calendly link and being like, do I want to schedule a 15 minute sales call or do I want to start this conversation in an email thread first and see if they're a real person or see if they're actually going to reply to me. And I think that getting that personal response helps build a lot of trust, which is just another positive signal um, for email and for your business. Yeah, that is such a good point. Um, what about, um, like, do you think it matters? Do you think it's important to have like a nurture sequence? Um, do you, or, or I should say, do you have a preference for the length of a nurture sequence? You know, three, five, and like, is the first one the about me? And, you know, people do it different ways. Oh yeah, for sure. So it really depends on your business and it also depends on what the initial goal is of somebody coming onto your email list. So I work with a lot of people who have like self liquidating offers where they promote like a lead magnet or a free workshop or something like that at the front end. And the goal of their welcome sequence is to sell somebody on like a $37 offer so that they can recuperate their ad costs. And so if that's your goal, you're going to need a couple emails, you know, three to five emails. It depends on how serious the problem is you're addressing or what the level of awareness or sophistication of your market is. Um, but yeah, you, you'll def if you're trying to sell something, you're definitely going to need more than one email. Um, yeah. And like if you're, but if your goal is just like to introduce yourself, to start to build that no like, and trust with your subscriber, and to sort of frame the next communication that's gonna come from you. Like you could just do that in one email. That's what I do, but I send a weekly email. So someone subscribes on Monday, they're gonna get my next email on Friday, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I always heard that, like if you're gonna have a nurture sequence, which most of us should have, um, that your first email should like have like the best of sort of like, this is an introduction to who you are. And because most people, if they're going to open up an email, it's that first one, if only to just grab the lead magnet that they just signed up for. So, and then the rest of the nurture sequence tends to sort of drop off. I mean, not always, but that first one supposedly gets the most opens. And so you kind of want to just, you know, put your best foot forward in that. Um, I think you should put but, your best foot forward in every email. You're you know? exactly right. If yes. you if if you're in the mindset that no one's going to read this, I'm not going to you know care about <laughs> this email. Then guess what? No one's going to read it, and no one's going to care about that email. But if you put your best foot forward in every email, you're the people who are your best prospects are going to read it, and they're going to keep reading your emails. And that's that's how you build good deliverability. It's just delivering consistently great content that people want and enjoy. Very good point. Okay, let me ask you this. How often do you clean your list? And, and let me pause and just for our listeners, 
um, who might not know, like list hygiene and list scrubbing, uh, is when you basically remove the people who are dead weight in your list. They're cold. They've gone cold. They're not opening anything. Uh, and they've been on your list for a while. And then, yeah, so however long a while is, I guess, is the question. Like, when do you, when do you cut that person? Great question. So this one, it really depends on your email sending strategy and the volume you're sending. So like if you, if you're sending out a weekly email, then, and it depends on how conservative you want to be as well. But if you're sending out a weekly email and somebody hasn't opened, clicked, replied, you know, uh, subscribed to a new form, gotten a, like they haven't taken any meaningful action in your world in 90 days, I would call them disengaged. You know, I would call them disengaged because you've sent out what 12 emails and they haven't read any of them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't immediately clean them though. I would put them into then a re-engagement campaign with a message you know can inbox at least one or two to just ask them, do you want to stay in my email list or not? Give them that binary choice, make it very easy for them to stay and make it very easy for them to unsubscribe. Everyone who re-engages from there, great. Like they're just back into your engaged list. But then everyone who doesn't, I would then put them into like a temporary mute hold where you would just, you basically pause emails for them for the next 90 days. So from day zero to day 180, and then periodically have a process where you send out an email to the people in that muted sort of purgatory segment because a percentage of them, you know, people get busy, they switch jobs, they use different emails, they, you know, you know, they go on vacation, whatever. So it's fine to attempt to re-engage them strategically and periodically. And then maybe you recuperate 10, 15, 20% of those people. The people who don't re-engage after your third attempt to reach them after 180 days, because you're still having these engagement monitoring automations going on, uh, they haven't gone through and opened up your emails from the past. Those are the people that I think you're probably safe to just unsubscribe. And so this is like subjective engagement based list cleaning. The second form of list cleaning is like objective list cleaning. Bounces. With a, yeah, not just bounces, but where you use a tool like zero bounce or never bounce or emailable and you validate every email address on your email list. And it tells you which ones are deliverable, which ones are disposable, which ones are spam traps, which ones are toxic spam complainers. And then you can use the data you have in your email platform to then cross-reference with the data you get from these tools and then just unsubscribe bad addresses, bots, spam accounts, all of that stuff. And then what do you, how often do you do that? Like that seems worthwhile once a month, I would think. Well, it depends on the size of your list. Like if you're at over 100,000 people, you need to be doing that quarterly. If you want to get really obsessive about it, you can validate at the time of subscription, you know, so when somebody subscribes, you can just, you can pay for a credit that validates that email address. Um, I, I, I don't think you really need to do that because you'll get enough data from the emails you're sending out in your email platform. But if you have like 25,000, like you can usually get away with once or twice a year. Um, but if you start noticing performance problems, that would be one of the first things I would do as well is just clean your list. I think the last thing we should talk about is is for the people who are apprehensive about sending a whole lot of emails during their launch, because I believe personally that you just have to get over it and you have to send the emails. Oh yeah, I mean, you, you de it's definitely it's definitely a mental hurdle to get over, and it's worthwhile to get over it. I think it would also be worthwhile to look at like why you're so apprehensive, like maybe you're a people pleaser, maybe you're worried about upsetting people, but this is also your business. And if you have a solution to people's problems, you have an ethical responsibility to get your message in front of them because you can help them. Um, so there's lots of, you know, like mental jujitsu you can do in your mind to make yourself feel good about that. But it's also good for deliverability. As long as you're doing all the other stuff that we've talked about before, um, your lists are clean. You have really tight engagement-based segments. Like 
you're sending out your launch emails, you're getting 30, 40, 50% open rates because sales emails, promotional emails are sometimes the most engaged with emails. You can actually fix deliverability problems through a launch if done correctly, or you can dig yourself deeper into a hole if done incorrectly. So it's just a great opportunity to reestablish or build your sender reputation. I will say one thing to definitely consider is you need to be mindful of really sharp increases in volume very quickly. That's a red flag for a lot of the inboxes. So if you haven't, if you've been emailing your email list once a month and you've been sending mm. on average 10,000 emails a month, and then you're going into a launch phase where you're going to be emailing twice a day and you all of a sudden go up to 500,000 emails a month, that can put you in spam and that can create problems. So you need to gradually increase your volume of emails that you're sending to get to the point where the inboxes trust you to send a lot of emails every single day. So yeah, it's a good point. And it helps fix part of the problem where, you know, you know, the person is cringing at themselves for blasting their audience with launch emails, knowing that they've been pretty quiet the last few months. And exactly. Then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, you know, buy my thing. And I think, you know, but the truth is that, that's a lot of people. So anybody listening to this and you're like, Oh, I'm guilty of that. That's a lot of people are, are guilty of that. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people aren't consistent as consistent as they might want to be. Um, so that's just something we can all work on together. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you're paying to acquire these subscribers. Like you should be talking to them. Like you're working hard. This is your business. And I know that not everyone's a copywriter, not everyone looks forward to sitting down and writing their weekly email or daily email or whatever it is. But if you could find a way to make it fun for yourself and a, you know, a great way to do that is to study copywriting and to learn about it and learn about storytelling and how to make content engaging. If you could find a way to make it fun for yourself because you have all these new ideas to experiment with, then yeah, that can be, that can be a great way to kind of overcome the resistance here. Do you have a favorite um, resource for beginning copywriters? I have a couple. So I've learned the most from my copywriting career from a group called Copy Hackers. So it's founded mm -hmm. by Joanna Weeb. I've been a copy school, you know, student since I think 2019. You know, I bought one of I bought one of their lifetime deals, which has proven to be the best investment I've ever made because they just keep making it better and I've got lifetime access. Wonderful. Yeah. Was so, that a like AppSumo deal? Maybe we can go find that deal. No, no, it's not AppSumo. They you have to be on their email list. And I don't I think that Copy School has moved to a monthly and annual mod model mm -hmm. at this point, but there's so much in there where even if you joined for a year and went through all of their content, like you'll be miles above of everybody else. You know, I've done a lot of the old school copywriting training as well from people like John Carlton, which have been amazing, Joe Sugarman. Um, but, you know, also just like, I learned a lot from just like watching movies and seeing how like movies and TV shows capture people attention and play with tension and stuff like that. And yeah, it's like, we all live in this world of entertainment and, you know, uh, storytelling, like once you kind of put the glasses on, you can start to see a little bit of like, oh yeah, that's, they started the movie this way and I've been glued to the edge of my seat since then. So. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and helpful. Very, very helpful. Now I know that, um, everybody listening is going to want to get on your email list and they can do that by going to deliverabilitynow.com. But there's also going to be a few folks I know who are listening that are thinking, oh my gosh, like that was a lot. And I just really don't want to tackle this, but I definitely need help. Do you work one-on-one -on -one with people and help them like fix this stuff? Yes, I absolutely work one-on-one -on -one with people. I, like I said, I partner with clients and entrepreneurs to fix their deliverability issues and Really the best way to get started is I offer a free 45 minute deliverability audit. So anybody who's listening to this podcast, if you're just thinking, yep, I think we've got some problems and I don't have the time or interest or bandwidth to deal with this, shoot me an email, matt at deliverabilitynow.com and we can set up a free 45 minute audit where 
we'll just jump inside of your email environment. We can run a couple of the tests that we talked about um, in this call, and I can take a look at your email setup to see if there are maybe problems with easy fixes, problems with more you know complex fixes, or maybe you don't have any problems at all. Sometimes it just can be so nice to have an expert look at something and you know it's like going to the doctor getting your blood work back and be like yep you're fine and it's just like okay good uh <laughs> right. it gives you gives you peace of mind moving yes. forward so yeah happy to do that for any of your listeners just shoot me an email matt at deliverabilitynow.com awesome matt thank you so much that's so generous of you and uh, and and you've been so generous with your time today i learned so much and i know our listeners did too and i just really come back anytime thank you so much my pleasure yeah thanks for having me